all to, to think about that. We can go through that again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all to our Wednesday morning class. Thank you for you that are here in person today and you that are joining us online. We want to welcome you. We are on an adventure, I'm going to call it, an adventure of exploring uh, a school of thoughts. I'm not going to say thought because there's many thoughts to these schools. There's not just one way. Just like in Christianity, look at all the different ways Christians believe, all the different denominations, all the different, uh, you know, even to the point they, they can argue with each other over the same Bible and what it means. And we have all these different denominations and all these different groups under the term Christian. Well, it's the same way with the Gnostic community. They had many different ways of looking at things, they had similar ways, but there were some things that were very different. And I think there was a purpose to why that intrigues me, uh, that the earlier teachings, uh, before we move into uh, A.D. or C.E., uh, C, what is it, E.C., e the, anyway, Common Era, uh, was the earliest to that, because the further away we get away from it, the more we get into man-made. If you get past the first century, the, uh, the, the, the 100s, the 200s, 300s. By the 400s, everything has been so organized and so edited and so hidden. See, it's about that time uh, around the uh, later uh, second, third uh, century that those who had the early teachings of the first century begin to hide it in jars. That was brilliant of them. They knew, they knew what was coming. They saw that there was getting ready to be the centralization and reorganizing of spirituality as a religion. Therefore, because people were scattered, because people believed in one God or gods and goddesses and, and all of the polytheistic uh, teachings that were out there, they thought, well, that's, our strength is going to be uniting those people into one universal belief. And what do you think that word is for universal belief? Catholicism. Look up Catholic. It means universal. And that's why I think there's more leniency in the Catholic Church, but it took a long time because the, uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church was the only true church. Everything else was, was heresy. Now it's, it's, it's how they consolidated their power. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to keep everybody in control, and they began to do everything from uh, create dogmas and doctrines and uh, they even changed the music. They changed the sound mm -hmm. because we believe that they were using the solfeggio frequencies that we teach before in the Gregorian chants before they were changed and taken out and finally lost. Mm -hmm. So uh, things like finding the solfeggio frequencies is a part of the promise that we have that all things will be restored back before the age ends. That's a promise. That's a promise. Everything in indigenous teachings that has been uh, moved and, and done away with, or, um, you know, they've tried to believe that these people are, a lot of the indigenous people are uh, savages, uneducated, not smart. That includes the Native Americans, Aborigines, and even some of the African American, uh, older ancient teachings and drumming, for instance, and all of that. All those things 
were kind of set aside as Christianity became a way, I'm going to say this, in which the white European began to take their place as the power of the world. Let's just tell it like it is. And one of the main things that they wanted to do was put the woman in their place. Why? What deep innate fear do they have concerning the power of the feminine? That's my question. It's not the specifics of it. It's what deep psychological fear is there about unleashing the power of the feminine? I didn't say of just women. I said the feminine. Because the feminine is the restored wisdom called Sophia. And we've learned in here, I don't know if you remember, but we've learned that it's Sophia that really messed up first by having a thought outside of entirety. Entirety is the word for the all true uh, creator with all of its attributes. See, if I just say creator, uh, then you're saying, well, what, what's before creator? You can't start with creator. How can you start with creator? How can you start with a mother or a father? Nobody starts as a mother or a father. You become a mother and a father by what you create. You mothers here are mothers because of your, your children makes you mother. It's your mother. It's your kids that call you mother. Or dad or father. So when this, what we call spiritual virgin spirit, which is totally, what, undefinable, non-local, had its first thought now, what was it that the only thought that it could have is about the only thing that existed was itself? And that's called forethought. Forethought. Forethought is the moment that the invisible, undefinable, non-local, spiritual, that we cannot in a hundred thousand lifetimes understand. So if you want to keep coming back, do it, or you can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I choose to stand still and just see that. I'm not coming back because I need another time to try to understand this thing. I need to understand it here and now, and that's what we're trying to do here. And to do that, we're going to wade through some heavy, mucky stuff that a lot of us have, and we don't, we don't know that we have. But we're still playing, we're still playing religion, people. We're still playing religion. Even in New Thought, there's just too much religion. The language is religious language. And through this teaching, we've started using forethought, hmm? entirety, the barbello. And you're going, what is that? But if I said the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you go, oh, that. Because you still are working through your religious language. And that's what's going on here at Heartlight is a transformation as we move more and more into a new language. Because even though a lot, and all of us, or we wouldn't be here, have changed our beliefs from what we were taught about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, uh, all those religious uh, Christian things, I know we've changed our intellect and our perception of it. But if we keep using the same words and the same language, we keep bringing it back to what it was. That's why I encourage us to do this thing of allowing a new language, a new tongue to be given to us. Say things differently. This is why I get so concerned about the word God. There isn't a more religious word on the planet than God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and people just say God. 
And because the God of the Old Testament dared to be brazen enough to say, I am God and there is no other, <laughs> we have just assumed that God is always the true creator. Creator of what? Let me ask you, creator of what? Our bodies? No. One of the worst teachings that ever came along is that God created your body. What a ridiculous thing to believe. Because your body, which is supposed to be in the image of God, means that God is in the shape of your body. <laughs> right? You know, that's the teaching. Adam, the body, was made in the image of God. Therefore, I look at my body, and I'm supposed to see the image of all that the Creator is. And I don't. Because I don't, I don't know who you worship, but my idea of my Creator is, my Creator is pure love and whole and is a spiritual attributes. Therefore, Spirit could only embody itself. Therefore, the first body that is made is a spiritual body in the likeness of that which created. In fact, it was that which created it. Are you with me? That's why we dare to be blasphemous, I'm sure, by your family and friends to call ourselves divine and sacred. Do you know how blasphemous that sounds? Because they believe the only divine and sacred is in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us are a bunch of bastards. The Bible says that. It says that you're gra grafted in by grace. You didn't deserve it. See, that's what salvation's built on. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. You're not really uh, my creation, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh-uh. Oh, man. <laughs> So, as I've told you, I heard that back in the late 80s in a convention I was speaking in, go and tell them I did not create their bodies. Common sense is a, a factor here. When you look in the mirror and see the image of your body, how many of you see your mother or your father mm -hmm. or your grand? Father, of course you do, because that's who made your body. A spiritual creator didn't make your body. Other bodies made your bodies. I don't look like my creator. I look like Harold and Beholz, trust me, more every year. It's really scary how much we start looking more and more like our parents and our genetic story. Even the Bible is clear. That which is of the flesh is of the flesh. That which is of the spirit is of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So a spiritual creator can only create itself, which is out of spirit, a spiritual embodiment of itself. Therefore, the true you, the true body, is your spiritual body. But what religion has helped us to do is project that on the screen of the body. Because I can't figure out why this loving God I was taught in my childhood was not healing every physical body that was asking for it. Do you think everybody here in Heart Light it's getting a healing that wants one. And I got to talk to Kathy, but it, we talked about it before, but it came to me, we got to stop this uh, list of people we pray for every week. Hmm. If we believe that they are created whole, as we say they are, and then we keep praying for them, we're retaining them and hold, holding them into an image of themselves that isn't true. Hmm. We need to pray and let it go and trust that it is done. And it is done in the realm of spirit. It is done. The healing is done. It is completely done. Mm -hmm. But we keep working on these bodies because we got in our head we're going to make them 
perfect. I'm not saying your physical body cannot become perfect, but you're not going to make it perfect. All the right minerals, vitamins, all the right anything. God knows that I've done. I mean, I'm the, I try it all. Looking for the fountain of youth, looking for immortality. I mean, I've done crazy stuff. But that's not my answer. I have to have let you answer for yourself. So anyway, I need to talk to you before I go any further. I know some of you are wanting more of the videos shown, but here's the thing. I'm taking a huge chance showing these. There is a $10,000 fine and two years of imprisonment to show these videos because they are copyrighted and they do not belong to those who are not taking the great course. Now, you can find these if you want them. There's 24 lessons. You can go through it yourself. Here's where I want you to be careful about. And I'm not tooting my own horn. But I've, there's a lot in there I don't at this point agree with. There's things that uh, I do and things I don't. So I've had to weed through the 24 classes because I think there's some dangerous parts of the teaching. I think with everything out there, there's dangerous parts of the teachings. You've really got to discern between uh, what is true for you and what is not true for you. Um, I mean, I could tell you some stuff, you're gonna go, oh my God, they teach that? They don't teach good things about women uh, and the feminine until you get underneath the real deep teachings of it. But on the surface, you're gonna go, uh-uh. So I know for me, I'll just give an example. When I came into Course in Miracles, I got that book and I was like everybody else, ready to throw it out. It's a hard book. I do not recommend people trying to study Course in Miracles on their own through that book. It'll totally confuse you and shut you down. It is written to do that. It is written to undo the ego in you. And the ego will go screaming at the reversal of the Course of Miracles because it's a correction, psychological correction, spiritual path. But you see, I was blessed to have someone, a tutor or someone to help me, Marianne Williamson. So I cut my teeth on her teachings of Course in Miracles back in the 80s. I was going to Denver every month and talking and she was just starting her career at Mile High in Denver and therefore people were feeding me these little cassette tapes of her and I really liked them. So through her, I learned A Course in Miracles. But I'll guarantee you, I'd have never learned it by myself. Anybody here tried it? How many has the Course in Miracles book? It's a big, thick book. Not easy reading whatsoever. You would want somebody to help instruct and to help you get there. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Gnostic thing. I'm trying my best to make sure we make it our own. And therefore, I'm not saying I won't once in a while show them because what we do, when we do show them, we, we get rid of that immediately. I'm not putting it on YouTube. I'm not putting this, this on at all. I can't do that. I'm not going to prison for this, <laughs> of misusing this copyright material. But it is available individually to any of you that want to do it. You can, I think I got mine on Amazon or somewhere like that. It was used, uh, you get to use books, you can get whatever. So I suggest if you really want the videos and you want all of that, that you should basically look into, and I'll help you in any way if you need the information where to get those. I just want you to be careful on trying to do it by yourself without some kind of a, a group uh, setting that we can have discussion and, 
and uh, I'm doing my best to run this all through the what I call the Holy Spirit teacher in me. Does that make sense to you? Everything that I do on Sunday or whatever, whatever the notes are, whatever I think I'm going to talk about may not come out that way if I run it through the Holy Spirit or Christ consciousness. It's going to come out in a different way. So um, I just wanted to say that because uh, I know a lot of really want me to show all these uh, videos all the time and I will maybe try to once in a while throw one in uh, uh, and we, we can continue to do that. I know the guy is wonderful, he's great, he's clear, he's brilliant with it, and uh, uh, we, can, we can enjoy that. Um, someone recently, I won't name the person, but someone who's listening to us, uh, talked to them this week, and they said they have a wonderful neighbor that they really love and really like, and they were over there, and the woman, the person said something about um, praising God or something like that. And this person, because of this class, said to her, and what God is that? <laughs> are, you, are you worshiping the Old Testament God or the New Testament God? Now, the, woman, the person did not become defensive, but said, oh, I never thought of that. And I thought she represents millions upon millions of people out there in religion who are confusing the Old Testament God as the father of the Christ. This is the most important contribution that we have right now to help people. Because I'm telling you, let me tell you, this is me, think of what it's worth. Things are getting pretty bad on this planet. It's not getting better. I wish to tell you that I thought by now human beings would be much more spiritually evolved, more peaceful with each other, more loving with each other, able to, uh, to settle their racial issues, gender issues, and all the isms that divide us. I thought by now we'd be intelligent enough, smart enough, and clever enough to take care of these things. Instead, it is getting worse and worse and worse. Why has it got worse? I think is because what we're connected into and plugged into that we're feeding. You've got to be careful when you use terms. Because every term you use, and let me back up, every thought, every feeling, and every emotion has a vibration, has a frequency to it. And that frequency goes out by divine law and seeks that which matches itself. Hmm? Called resonance of frequency. So when you use a certain term, in a certain way, it ignites itself with others who are using that same term in that same way that you're using it until it causes a morphogenic field to be developed, which at some point through the subconsciousness begins to control the mass consciousness of the people. And that's why I think that even in the literalism of the Bible, that Jesus is so clear to help these people unplug themselves from the God they had served to the source or God that he had brought to the earth by allowing it to incarnate in him. I just don't know how to get that over to you, but, but you can understand, uh, here's somebody 2,000 years ago on the earth that's like nobody else, in my opinion. Yeah, there was Buddha 500 years before that. He was wonderful. I love Buddha. But Buddha was about human enlightenment. Human enlightenment. Jesus was about divine enlightenment. Remember what I said to you Sunday? Salvation unto our God. Not salvation unto human beings. Human beings aren't lost. God's lost in human beings. 
We've lost the true God in ourselves and replaced it with an image of religion of some God that is not the true God that created us. And every time we use God loosely and come from that belief that I'm talking to the one and only God, then I'm feeding that. It can be through worship, song, conversation, or speaking that consciousness moves through sound. And so I, I'm really trying to take this as careful and slow as I can. So let's go back to some of these similar things here that uh, that uh, it is said that Jesus said. So imagine all of these people who had uh, bought into the belief that they could reach enlightenment or totality through observing all of the laws of the God of the Old Testament, which was failure. And the Bible's clear, the law failed. Keeping the laws failed. And because it failed, it said there was a need. And there was a need for a new testament or new covenant. A new order. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So you move from the old that's what testament means. Testament means an old co covenant a, of law based upon these laws. Now, these laws are the attributes of the God of the Old Testament, but not the attributes of the true creator. Huh? They thought the attributes of God was... Um, the thing about not eating shrimp and all that. All those 613 different crazy things that you're not supposed to do in the Bible. The whole, the whole Pentateuch, the whole book of, of uh, uh, Leviticus and all of that stuff in there. I, I don't know if you've ever read it, but there's some crazy stuff in there. It is not kind to anybody or anything. And once that had run its course, there was a need to enter into a new covenant. So let's look at some of the things in the old that might be important for us to understand. In the old, the symbol or type of the Old Testament God is in the tabernacle. The Old Testament tabernacle. I was known back in the 70s for my teachings of the tabernacle. That's what I did. I taught every pin, every color, every measurement, everything in the tabernacle. And did you know there's 50 chapters in the Bible dedicated to the tabernacle? And one verse about being born again. 50 chapters, tabernacle, one verse, you got to be born again. Which do you think one? You think with every Christian, it's about are you born again? So the tabernacle was a type and shadow of the God of the Old Testament. There were three parts of that tabernacle. There was an outer court, right? The outer court. It was it was in, but not into the tabernacle. It was in the court, but it was not into the tabernacle. So it is those who were, they were in, but out. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of people like that who's in, but they're still out. <laughs> then you entered into the, uh, the inner sanctuary. And in there you found candlesticks and table of showbread and the brazen altar for baptism and all of that. And you moved in to a deeper understanding. But here's the thing I want to bring to you. 
the, the main part of it called the Holy of Holies that contained the image of this God as a mercy seat was veiled off from the people. People could not go in there. It was too sacred. Too sacred. The only one that could was the high priest of the order of Aaron. Once a year, Aaron went in for everybody. This priest had this big, beautiful breastplate with 12 stones, sardis stone, amethyst, all these beautiful stones, and each one represented one of the tribes of Israel. So there were 12 stones for 12 tribes of Israel. Now, for there to be a yearly atonement to appease this angry God, because this God is angry, not pleasant, not kind, angry all the time, pissed off all the time about everything, ready to punish you, kill you, burn you, and I can show you scriptures. Kill children, didn't care. So to appease this God, there was a lot of shedding of blood of animals. That was important, to sacrifice to it. So the high priest went in once a year and took with him the representation of the people. And through the sacrifice, they were atoned for one year. But they couldn't do it for themselves. It had to be done for them. And this is why I've revisited some terms here that I used to didn't like about Christian language about receiving a personal savior. I don't think that's so bad from where I am right now. I think that what Yeshua did personalized the presence of the true spiritual God into himself. But here's the key. Didn't say, I'm going to be the only one to go in for you every year, but I'm going to rip the veil from top to bottom and I'm going to put out a message, whosoever will, let them come. And you can personally experience the very knowledge of God for yourself. <sighs> Much better covenant <laughs> than that covenant. So all these laws and laws contained are now going to be replaced with divine attributes. Truth, love, peace, light, all these things that we talk about. And every one of those words are not words that are like a, 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 an object. How do you hold love in your hand? What does it look like? Is it three-dimensional? No. Uh, what about peace? Can you hold peace in your hand? You know, you can have a picture of peace or you can have a plaque that says peace on it. But peace itself, what do you do with it? It's, it's subjective. Right? Now you're getting into attributes of something you can't define with the human mind. You're getting back to entirety. You're getting back to the, the, the virgin spirit of creation. But you can't understand it, but you can understand its attributes. And when you understand its attributes, you're understanding it. So you have to get rid of all your psychological graven images that you've put in your head. So if, if what happened 2,000 years ago would have been honored for what it was, we'd be living in a whole different environment. But the fact that they wanted to shut it down. One thing that dwells deeply in the psyche of Yellowboth, 
Yalaboth. Get this, Yah, Yalaboth, Yahweh. Hmm? Is greed hmm. and fear. And when the power of greed, which is its attribute, showed up, we begin to build systems based on greed and fear. Everything from then was built on that, and still is, still is today. Even when their own Bible says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. They don't believe their own Bible. They've never read the Bible for themselves. They have no personal experience with the Bible. They have it through their denomination, through their organization, through their priest, through their rabbi, and through their minister. That's how people think they know the Bible. But they have not had a personal experience and gnosis with how to decode the Bible because the, the living word of the true creator is coded in two, even the misinterpretations that man has made of it. And Jesus is clear about that. Clear about that. So, I'm gonna read John 8, 44 to you again. I like it out of the mirror. Now, who's being talked to here in these New Testament books are early new converts into Christianity. And let me say, there was a time that Christianity was a much better Christianity than the Christianity of the fourth century. So again, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just changed Christianity to Christianity. That helps me a little bit to separate what was before the Christianity we know today that's man-made and the Christianity that would be considered a more mystical Christianity. And Gnosis is a more Christian, uh, uh, a more Christian uh, mystical side of it. That would include the Gnostics, the Essenes, mm -hmm. and some of those that are not mentioned in the Bible are the early, early true people who were trying to hold on to the original teachings. And you have the same thing with Judaism. Before Judaism is organized into the Judaism of modern day, it was certainly the Kabbalah. Uh, same thing with is Islamic teachings. Before it became the Islamic organized today, it is the Sufi. Mm -hmm. All of these are more mystical and different versions before it's organized. So every religion has that part of it. That was the closest to the founder. Even Buddhism. If you get closer to Buddha's experience, you'll find a more pure Buddhism than the Buddhism that's become trendy. Buddhism is trendy. You see Buddhists everywhere. It's dec in people's decoration in their living rooms. Everybody's got a Buddha today. It's just, it's just trendy to have a Buddha somewhere or to mention Buddhism. I don't care if it's even Fillmore, uh, Holmes or some of those who were the founders of New Thought, if you go back closer to them when they had the experience, you're going to get a pure teaching than you are from modern day as it's organized itself. I'm sorry, you're not going to get the purity by going to the headquarters and learning the theology of New Thought. Because New Thought was not meant to be a theology, it was meant to be an experience that they had and they said you can have it too. Jesus had it, he said you can have it too. Buddha had it, he said you can have it too. Muhammad had it, said you can have it too. Everybody who's had the true experience has tried to empower those not to be just followers of their experience with just knowledge, but to follow them because they've had the same experience they've had. And that somewhat intrigues me about such communities as this. 
I don't think most of us are here because we all went to the same theology school <laughs> and learned the same way to believe, but I think because of your personal journeys you've been on, you've all crossed and ended up here because you've got enough in common. Does that make sense to you? That's different. Now, I can go out and build a church if I start having a, a catechism and indoctrinating you and getting you go through a year of lessons and you sign something that you'll pay tithe and, and you'll do all of that. That's easy to herd them. It's like a herd coming in and being prepared to stay within the fence of the religion. We don't have that fence here, and it makes it somewhat challenging at times to allow the freedom of so many of you to kind of have your own personal path. It's just that we've all crossed paths mm -hmm. at this time. Some come here, they even like what they hear sometimes, they don't come back, they don't stay, because they're not on the path. That apparently is the path that we have crossed with each other. And that has to be okay. You can't convert and make people. I didn't go out and knock on doors to get you to come here to Harley. Most of you came here and found, we found each other. So, So in the book of John, and John's a really important book because even in the miracle Bible, in the mirror Bible, I find it interesting that he does not have Matthew, Luke, or Mark. He starts only with John. And the reason he does, I think, is because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he believes the beginning of the Logos, of the true Word, begins in the Gospel of John. But here's what he says. <clears throat> Jesus said, this is in 842, if you're convinced that God was your father, you would love me. Look, here I am. I did not arrive here by my own doing. I proceeded from him who sent me. Jesus, the Christ, the Christ of Jesus, is the mind of the true creator making it in passed all the filters of human thinking and made it and landed in earth. Do you get that? And that's why we refer to Christ consciousness in Jesus. Jesus brought the mind of the true God without any filters through the mind of the old God in it and brought the purity of Christ consciousness to the, to the planet. I did not arrive at my own being. I proceeded from him that sent me. You do not understand my language because you do not hear my logic. My dialect seems foreign to you because you are not familiar with the logic of the true God. Some of you right now could be having a time with my language because I'm talking a different language about a different God than the God. If I talked about the God that most of you may believe in, you'd understand me. But when I speak in the language of the true God, your brain may have a reaction of almost resistance. You might be acquainted with the letter of the law in scripture, but you are not acquainted with the word. The word. You are, he's talking to these people that are coming from the old God, the Old Testament, new converts. Because here's what they wanted to do. They wanted to bring the old God's mindset into the new covenant that was being made through Jesus. They wanted to repeat the old, but maybe in new ways. This is why you got to be careful about things like uh, the word new. He shall do new things or whatever. Because if you say new things, you're also giving power to old things. <laughs> it's different to say spiritual things, which is neither old nor good, but it is. But he's saying to them, 
and trying to teach them while he was here, you are of the offspring of a fallen mindset. And you deserve to prove its diabolical parenthood in your willingness to execute its cravings. Oh my God. In other words, you are the product of the Old Testament God, which is a fallen mindset from the true God. And you desire to prove it, to prove the diabolical God is your God. And you try to spiritualize it. And it's not even your parenthood. <laughs> and what it wants is for you to execute its cravings. What does it crave for? War, hatred, separation, racism, and every ism that there is. And I don't know about you, but I make it clear I will not feed you any longer. No. <laughs> Mm. Wow. wow. This cast down mindset is what kills the anthropos. Anthropos is the true man, the true spiritual being, the true one. The anthropos since the beginning. It violently opposes the idea and the image and likeness of God in human form. The Diabolos mindset cannot abide in the truth. There is no connection with truth. Lying is its language. Even wow. Jesus said of the, of the adversary, the devil, you're a liar from the very beginning. <laughs> I'm reading a really good book right now called They Lied to Us. Ooh. And it takes every controversial subject, whether it's homosexuality or whatever, and how we've been lied to about these things and bought into these lies. Hmm. <sighs> also in John, I'm just I'm going to stay with this, okay? I, I, I just want to stay with this. Jesus, uh, <clears throat> let's start here. This is Nicodemus who comes to Jesus in the night because he's really searching, but he doesn't want anybody to know. How many, how many people do you know like that? <laughs> you get people off on their own, they're a whole different uh, way of talking to them than if you get them in the tribe. Uh, you get them in the tribe, then they start, uh, oh no, I don't believe that, oh uh, yes, uh, I don't know about that. And they really do. More people, more people are having a personal awakening out there than you can imagine. But they're afraid to let people know. So they come to Yeshua's teachings in the night of the dark side of the soul. Don't think they're not out there. And that's what I'm getting ready to go into is trying to reach those people. That's my next step. And I might find one here, and I might find one there, and I might find there, but they are out there, and they need to be empowered yes. to come out. Yes. Come out. If we can get enough of them to do it and reach critical mass, we'll tilt the whole planet into a different direction. I hope you'll join me yes. in, doing, in doing that. <laughs> So Jesus answered him emphatically. No one would even be able to recognize anything as coming from God, true God, Father, domain, unless they are born from above to begin with. Mm. Now that's what's translated in the King James as born again, that fundamentalists jump on. But if they'll look out in the, in the uh, paraphrasing of the part of their Bible, they will see that the word is not born again, but born from above. Mm -hmm. Now Nicodemus looks at this and says, how can this be? I can't enter into my mother's womb again. But he really could if he knew who his mother was. <laughs> if he knew about the womb of consciousness, huh? the barbello the womb, the feminine womb in all of us that is always there once she is properly seeded hmm. with the sperm of the true God. 
And I'm saying that because I have a translation, almost brought it today, in an old amplified, in the, in the Bible it says, and those who are of the seed of God cannot sin. But the word in this particular is the sperm of God. The sperm is the sperma or the word. When the right words enter into your human brain through the womb of consciousness, she will conceive it. She will receive it. She will receive it first. Then she will conceive it and we will achieve it. Hmm? It's up to us to achieve it. Jesus answered, you have to get this. <laughs> That's why I feel today. You have to get this. Unless someone is born out of the water, the womb of the spirit, there'll be no possible connection with the realm of the true God. So let's look at it from a spiritual psychological point of view. It means you got to remember who you are and where you came from. That's being born from above. It means that I have to get in touch with the part of myself, my spiritual creation self. That is beyond this third dimensional, fourth dimensional time space world that has been held under the power of the God of the Old Testament, even though it has been allowed to mix itself with the New Testament Christian church until we have the term Judeo-Christianity. That was the worst thing that happened, is when Christians partnered with the Old Testament and made it the same God over both. And that's when the true God was lost. It was lost in the teachings of the church. But nothing's really lost. It's just forgotten. <laughs> so that's the beautiful thing about, uh, and I want to say this, this is why in the great wisdom of truth and light, there was a spark that followed into the darkest aspects of the God of this world and continued to incarnate into the human body and story. Now, I'm going to use the religious term, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, according to A Course in Miracles, which I think has it right, the Holy Spirit is this. It is the voice of God in the illusion of the dream to awaken them that sleep. The Holy Spirit is the true logos, or word of the true creative God, in the human being with its ability to make us remember who we are and therefore awaken from the illusion that we've caught ourselves in. This means that war, hatred, racism, and every ism that there is, is actually of itself part of the illusion. They're not, it's not even real. Oh yeah? Tell that to someone the way I've been treated. We made it real. It's not real. We made it real. With our own power, we have given this power to the illusions of this world. And that's what the cry has always been. Awake. Thou that sleepest, and shake thyself from the dust. I want to say before she takes this offering, I thank you so much for your, uh, for your support. And it's going to be very important how you support this uh, class. I've got about seven minutes, and I want to end this with something that I have here. Everybody's excited over this news that I'm getting ready to share with you. For they have found God's name in our DNA 500,000 times in each human cell. 
Hmm? Who's that? Scientist, geneticist. This is all comes from did God sign DNA? Um, I find the rest of the article here, but this is not coming from a religious point of view. Uh, it is coming. They found abbreviations or full versions of 14 most common names of God, most of them found in the Hebrew scriptures, appear 500,000 times in each cell uh, in the human body. It appears to be saturated with the names of God. One of the most common is the, uh, the genes of WH, -W YHWH. You all know what that is? The Temetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetemetem
they think you're a little bit out of the world. Yeah. 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 They think yeah. you're out of it. That's what yeah. they'll say. And you ought to go, thank you. I've been trying to get out of it. Yeah. So that's a compliment when somebody says, well, you're just, you're just too far out. Yeah. Of course I am. Because I found the key that unlocks the door that lets me out of the, of, of the matrix. So all of us collectively coming together and getting out of this world, the matrix, is bringing the new world in right here, right? It's not like going out in the ether right. somewhere. Right, no, 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 It's creating the new world right here. That's yes. right. Yeah. Yes. Very good, very good way to put it. So I know this is, I know I'm dealing with layers and layers of your belief systems and your, the way you've been formed by culture and religion and, and all that. I understand that, I mean, I'm cutting through this in myself. Don't think it's not bringing up stuff in me. I'm getting a, a lot of things to correct myself about but we're working through this together we're working out our own salvation with fear and the word fear is such a bad word but it is the word fear should be translated reverence yeah. Yeah. and with great reverence i understand it so bottom line people and i'll let you go we all have issues right now, most of us. Whether it's dealing with diabetes, EMS, <coughs> arthritis, joint issues. We all have something. I mean, if there's somebody here just perfectly physical, please come and see me. Because <laughs> you can, I'll have you up here, you know, but you gotta share. You gotta, you gotta share it how other people can, not just, just, not, just me. <laughs> But if you want to not deal with that any longer, if you want to find the answer, the answer is one, paradoxically taking a step back and understand the history of why we're where we are because of where we've been. Mm -hmm. Once we get that cleaned up and we become a new creature in Christ consciousness, then do we begin to look forward to bringing in the systems and the kingdom of God into the world. So hang in there. <laughs> I'm doing my best to just be guided with this. I, I, I don't want to just follow the book. I just don't want to follow because I'm trying to follow the spirit on how mm -hmm. to bring this together. So be patient. If you don't understand everything, that's fine. And maybe that's good because you don't want to understand something that you validate as a belief that's not a knowing. Anything that you've heard today that you kind of had a knowing, good, hold on to that. The rest put on the shelf, contemplate it, judge it not right or wrong, good or bad. And wait. Because if it is yours, your innate intelligence will remember it and resonate with it and bring it into gnosis or the divine epiphany of knowing. And you'll go, I get it. I get it. Please don't try to build it on what I get. Build on what you get. Does that make sense to you? I'm not trying to build a new theology here. I'm not trying to heart like to have the one and only belief system that we all must believe. But we do have to have enough to tie us together. Yeah. And I think all of you that have come to Heart Light have come from good foundations of new thought, esoterical teachings, the mystic, mystery teachings. All of you that have come from that way, of course, the miracles and all that, have a good foundation to build on. But don't you dare think those things were the goal. Mm. They're the means to where you're going now. Does that make sense to you? Don't get stuck and say, I found it, this is it. This is the only one that I'm gonna believe. This is the only truth that I have. Don't, all of that has prepared you for what is coming in. And we all in our spirit should be excited today. I'm not in my flesh. My flesh is not happy because my flesh has, is a part of what's been settled 
in me is the way it's supposed to be. And then we accept it and we adapt to the pain and we adapt to the diseases and we adapt to death and we adapt to all of these things because we know how to adapt. Don't adapt. In the memorial here Saturday when I got up, all I could keep saying was, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? I just kept saying it. Everything I went to, I came back. O oh death, where is your sting? O oh grave, where is your victory? This is Bible, scripture. And I just kept saying it. Like I was trying to pierce through this facade that everybody has to get sick. Everybody has to get old. Everybody has to die. Everybody. No, 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 no. We need a new mindset and not be from the fallen mindset. So let us rise and shine for thy light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon me and I shall shake and vibrate myself from the dust of this world as I enter into the heights and being born above. Take a moment with me. Let's call upon the Holy Spirit in us, the spark of of the true mind of the true creator that resides deeply within our own brains and heart. It is the light not seen by the five senses. Even though the brain itself is in the darkness of the skull and never sees the light, it holds the light such as a piece of coal holds millions of years of light until it's ignited. Today we ask the Holy Spirit to ignite in us the light that is buried deep into the darkness of the subconsciousness of our own human brain to awaken it and let the gnosis of knowing and remembering come as the lightning from the east to the west and taking with it all the webs of man's traditions and dogmas and darkness as in the background I hear the laughter of God saying I laugh only at your puny human efforts to be what I've already created you to be. <laughs> know this day and who you are and you shall know who I am. For I've torn the veil of, over your hearts and your hearts are open, be careful and be aware of the sensitivity of every environment you're around. For you're like a sponge right now, absorbing. Protect yourself each and every day. In every situation, learn to build the garment of light around you. But at the same time, fear not those things. Know who you are in every situation. Says spirit. <laughs> Let's take a deep breath. Thank you so much. I appreciate your coming and um, supporting this. And we'll just kind of see where it all takes us. All right. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. It is a beautiful day. Go and yeah. enjoy a beautiful day. Yes. We will see you Sunday. Uh, for you that will be here on Sundays. Let's continue to send prayers to Greg. Greg has had a, a, a pre-recovery of code. Of code, not code, of uh, COVID. So he has to start all over again. I'm zero so it doesn't sound like good so I really want in fact let's just do it right now I don't want to just say it let's just do it true 100% father of spirit father of lights father of truth father of reality in which you have created Greg whole we appeal to that part of himself that spiritual part that you have created 
Let it become greater than that part that has been made and formed from the dust of this world. We call forth 100% pure guides and angels from the true living God and Father of lights to him and bring forth restoration and healing. We ask this. Know it is done in the name of the living Christ. In him and in us and in all. And so it is. Thank you.